Hello, I'm Dr. Tony Engrafia. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Cornell University and president of physicians, scientists, and engineers for healthy energy. I'm going to give you a lecture today on what we call the very basics of unconventional gas development from shale, high volume fracking on clustered multi-well pads with long laterals. You probably heard it called fracking. Uh, calling it fracking doesn't do it justice, and as you'll see as this lecture unfolds, you're going to need to know a lot more than just about fracking. Let me also begin by saying that our organization, physicians, scientists, and engineers, has a hierarchy which you're probably familiar with sociologically and economically. Physicians, scientists, and engineers. That was meant to be funny, but the serious part is that hopefully you're going to see during the course of this lecture that we have to start with the engineering. If you don't understand how shale gas is produced, you won't be able to understand the science between its production and human health effects. So over the course of the lectures you're taking, you're going to hear from me at the engineering end. You're going to hear from scientists talking about how solids, liquids, and gases that result from the production of shale gas can possibly enter the human health arena and you'll be hearing from physicians about how those solids, liquids, and gases that have entered the human health arena might negatively impact human health. So that's the motif. So let's begin. Um, I'm going to first spend some time showing you what shale gas development, modern shale gas development, from multi-well clustered pads with high volume hydraulic fracturing from long laterals in a spatially intense environment looks like. You can go to Texas and see this, you can go to Louisiana and see it, you can go to Arkansas and see it, or more recently you can go to Pennsylvania and see it. So I've assembled a group of photographs that show you various stages of the drilling, the fracking, and all of the infrastructure at the surface that's required to get the shale gas out of the ground and transported, processed, stored, and eventually used. So. The slide I'm showing now is typically what is called a pad. A pad is an area on the surface where drilling occurs. And as you can see, this is no longer, as it was in previous years, a small area. It's typically along the, along the lines of 10 acres of land clearing that has to be done for one pad. In detail on this slide, you might not be able to see it, but this pad is actually home to five wells. So when I've said clustered pads, I'll have to explain what I mean by that, but when I say multi-well pads, what I mean is on each pad there's typically 5, 10, 15 wells. Because there are so many wells on one pad, there is a lot of frac fluid, which starts off as water, chemicals added, propant added, we'll talk about that later, but you'll see associated with this pad are four what appear to be human-made ponds, and they are. Uh, some of them, some of those ponds are holding quote, fresh water, unquote, to be used to create frac fluid. Some of them are holding returned frac, frac fluid, also called flowback, as a result of the hydraulic fracturing process. Some of them are holding drilling mud, uh, the material that accompanies the drill bit as it does, it does its job drilling a more or less three mile long uh, well bore. Uh, the next picture is an aerial view of another pad. Again, this is a multi-well pad. Again, this one has three uh, lagoons. And you can see in this case uh, a more than 10 acre excavation that has taken out literally thousands of trees. Uh, this next picture shows you something that is more appropriate for this particular lecture on human health effects because it shows the proximity between homes and elements of what I call the surface infrastructure. So here you can see there's a pretty long distance between in this case the seven well pad and the nearest home. Uh, but there's a very short distance between that nearest home and a waste impoundment. So when we talk about uh, having someone's home close to shale gas, we have to be careful what we mean. You can be a long distance away from the well pad, but still be very close to another element of the infrastructure, which could have deleterious effects on human health. Uh, here's another photograph that shows basically the same thing on a larger view. In this case, we're seeing three well pads labeled well with multiple wells. You'll see a number of private homes. You'll see a frack water waste pit, a processing facility, I'll explain what that is, and a compressing facility. 
So a compressing facility is a series of very powerful pumps that increase the pressure of the gas coming out of the wells so that it can enter a pipeline. A processing facility is effectively a refinery. It takes what comes out of the well, which is typically not just natural gas, methane, but also natural gas liquids, uh, propane, butane, ethane, uh, and maybe even oil, depending upon where this particular geology is, and it has to separate those products so they can go to different markets. So this is a, a view of all the kinds of infrastructure one would expect associated with shale gas production. Again, the wells themselves and the pads, the pipelines that you can see, you can't see here because they're already buried, but you can see where the ground had to be excavated and trees removed for pipelines. Uh, compressor stations, flowback lagoons, freshwater lagoons, uh, mud lagoons, and processing facilities. All of these things have to be taken into account as potential sources of solid, liquid, and gas effluents, which could become sources of impact on human health. And one more slide, just to emphasize the point, uh, be careful when someone says, I lived close to, finish the sentence. Uh, if you're living close to a well, that's one thing. But if you're living this close, as you can see here, there are two Mac mansions, multi-million dollar private homes, literally within a stone's throw uh, of a frack water waste pit. And this was of the super mister type, not mystery, but mister. Uh, what you probably can't see in detail in this photograph is that there are fountains, pumps at the bottom of this pit spraying the effluent up in the air in an attempt to get it to evaporate to reduce the quantity of, fluid, of liquid that has to ultimately be transported for disposal. So clearly, if you're living downwind of this site, you're exposed to evaporated VOCs, methane, and other potentially bad things. The point I want to make here, in summary, on these first few images, is that despite all the things you've been hearing recently and reading about shale gas production in the U.S., it's still relatively new. Uh, compared to the million or so oil and gas wells that have been drilled and fracked in the United States since the late 1940s. There have only been about 25,000 shale gas wells drilled and fracked in the United States in the last 10 years. So what we're seeing is a development that has just begun. Um, and what I want to emphasize is that it's not just the well, it's not just a well, it's not just drilling a well, it's not just fracking a well, it's everything that comes before that process and everything that comes after that we also have to consider when we're talking about human health effects. So the next phase of my lecture is Geology 101, Drilling 101, Cementing and Casing 101, and Fracking 101. How do you get gas or natural gas liquids out of a shale formation? And the industry calls this an unconventional process because it's not like the typical process that had been used up until recently to get gas uh, out of a formation. Up to this time, gas came out of non-shale formations. Um, so this image shows a, a conglomeration of what used to be done with what is now being done. So on the surface is a pad. I just showed you pictures of a pad. This, of course, is a cartoon. Here is a drill rig, which is in place while the drilling is going on. And a conventional well would have involved drilling more or less straight down into what we call an accumulation, a trapped pocket of natural gas. That's not what's being shown in this image. This image shows uh, a cartoon of what happens when the gas is in fact distributed in a shale layer, which you see running more or less horizontally across the bottom of this image. It's important to note that that shale layer might be a mile or, mile or more below the surface of the earth, but it's only going to be on the order of a hundred to two hundred, few hundred feet thick. So it makes no economic sense and no technological sense to drill straight down and have only a very small section of the well, perhaps only a few hundred feet, exposed to the shale because the gas in the shale is everywhere. It's not accumulated in a large pocket like it is conventionally. It's actually distributed in a very, very impermeable formation called shale. That necessitates having to drill not just vertically downwards into the shale, but to drill laterally. And that's why I have this image called the lateral. That's the portion of the well that goes along the shale, not just into it. And because of modern technology, drillers can make that lateral go for thousands of feet, typically five to 10,000 feet, typically longer laterally than vertically. That exposes a very long distance of the well, a very long length of the well to the shale, which is 
ideal because if the gas is everywhere, you want to get as much gas out as you can by exposing as much as the well as you can. I'm now going to go from this cartoon to an actual image. I'd like to take you down 5,000 feet and show you an actual image of what happens down there. We can't do that. So I'm going to ask you to use your imaginations and imagine that we are walking up uh, one of our lovely gorges up here in New York State, upper New York State. And if you were walking up a gorge, you typically you'd be walking on shale. So this image shows black shale, shale that used to have gas in it, exposed on the surface beneath the creek. And you'll notice that there's what appear to be supernaturally straight lines etched in the shale. Uh, those weren't drawn there by kids with crayons, and they weren't cut by engineers. Those straight lines are natural hydraulic fractures. They were put there by nature. They're the result of gas pressure in the shale actually fracturing the shale sometime in the last 300 million years. So shale that can produce natural gas is already, already hydraulically fractured. What humans are trying to do is re-fracture it. So now I'm going to go through a series of button clicks and show you how that works. So in the previous slide, I showed you the concept of the lateral, the ability to drill a long distance through a shale formation. Well, this red line is the lateral. Use your imagination. That's now a pipe, a casing, that's been drilled and inserted for thousands of feet along the shale. And as you can see, that red line is intersecting many of these natural hydraulic fractures. The gas in the shale that's readily available is contained in those existing fractures. Think of those existing fractures as storage units, they're reservoirs. Because they were formed by gas pressure, they still contain gas pressure, and they're the most readily available source of natural gas. So we solved one of the technical problems. We've been able to drill laterally thousands of feet so that this steel pipe can intersect all those cracks all those fractures. The problem is it's a steel pipe. Gas doesn't want to flow into a steel pipe unless you punch holes in it. So the next step in the process is to punch holes in that steel pipe that's called perforating it. So now you have possible access points for the gas which is out in the shale uh, to find its way into that, in this case, red line which is really a steel casing. But that's not good enough because the gas pressure in those hydraulic fractures, natural hydraulic fractures, uh, the gas in those natural hydraulic, fra natural hydraulic fractures doesn't want to easily flow uh, back into those small holes. Hence the necessity for re-hydraulic fracturing. So the next step in the process is to pump very large volumes of fracturing fluid through that production casing, that red line, that lateral. It flows out of the holes that have been punched in that steel casing and into those natural fractures. The easiest place for that fluid to go is in already fractured rock. In doing so, it reopens those natural fractures wider than they are. They could be only a few thousandths of an inch wide right now. By pumping fluid under very high pressure into them, they can be widened to a few tenths of an inch. That makes them gas superhighways. The gas that's now stored in them can very easily flow back through the holes that we've punched in that steel casing and up to the surface. So the actual human-induced hydraulic fracturing process is nothing more than an attempt to force open existing fractures which are the prime reservoirs for natural gas which caused the fractures in the beginning. Of course, when you pump all that fluid down to reopen all those fractures, you have to get the fluid out, otherwise it's in the way of the gas. So that process is called flowing back after the re-hydraulic fracturing, much but not all of the fluid that was pumped down at a very high pressure flows back up that conductor casing to the surface, has to get captured, and as I showed you previously, it gets temporarily pumped into open pits. That material that flows back, flow back fluid, contains residuals of the chemicals that were added to it, and we'll talk more about the chemicals in a minute, but it also contains whatever was in the shale formation. It's been down there for a few hours, a few days, a few weeks. It's going to pick up what was down there. And what's down there are salts, a variety of salts, a variety of heavy metals, a variety of um, hydrocarbons, because after all, this is a hydrocarbon reservoir, and possibly naturally occurring radioactive materials. So all that gets picked up by this 
very high volume of fluid, we're talking millions of gallons per well, flows back to the surface, has to get captured and hopefully properly stored, transported and disposed of so that it does not impact human health. So put together everything I said so far, we have a pad, and believe me, we're gonna have more than one pad, but on a pad, we might have eight wells, 10 wells, 12 wells. Each of those wells is going to use about 5 million gallons of frac fluid. A significant percentage of that frac fluid flows back out of each well after it's been fractured, refractured, a few million gallons. So you have a few million gallons of hazardous liquid that has to be captured, temporarily stored, transported, processed and ultimately taken care of in some way that does not harm humans. So what we're doing basically is creating a flow network. Those gold lines here, yellow lines, indicate that the flow path for the gas to get out of the shale formation through these now propped open, wider natural pathways uh, into the lateral, into the surface. I'm now going to show you a third kind of video, or visual I should say, um, that was done by Shell Corporation to show its shareholders how it actually performs this process of multi-well clustered pad, spatially intense, unconventional development of gas from shale formations. So I have to explain this image to you. Uh, it's actually part of a 3D video created by Shell, as I said, to show their shareholders. And so I'll interpret it. In the upper left corner, uh, of this video, you see a, a portion of a topographic map. That's the green portion in the upper left. Uh, this is a portion of the topographic map of a county in Pennsylvania, Tioga County, Pennsylvania. The gray blob that you see in the image is actually a visualization of the upper surface of the Marcellus Shale Formation beneath a section of Tioga County. So it is possible using modern technology for a gas operator to use micro seismic reflection techniques to actually visualize at the surface what's down there. Uh, think of it as an engineer's x-ray device. So that gray area is the upper surface of the Marcellus and as you can see it's not flat, it's not horizontal, it's bent, contorted, twisted and in fact faulted. That's just the way the geology is in the northeast part of the Pennsylvania. The next part of this image I want you to look at are the series of vertical lines, each of which has a different color. Each one of those vertical lines is starting at the surface from a pad location. And each one of those vertical lines is one or more vertical portions of wells. So remember, at each pad you can have multiple wells. So each one of these vertical lines can be, in some cases, just one well, or in other cases, as you can see here, six wells. You can also see the lateral portions of the wells. The idea here, the fundamental idea behind what I've been calling, with many words, unconventional development of shale gas using clustered multi-well pad technology with ultra-high volume hydraulic fracturing from long laterals is captured in this one image. The idea here is that Shell has leased all the land here and ultimately they want to put a vertical that you see in this message, in this picture, a series of verticals from each pad. Each one splays out at the bottom as a lateral. And the whole idea is to coat that entire gray surface with laterals. It's an incomplete process in this image. None of the operators in Pennsylvania have completed their process. Uh, there are only 6,500 shale gas wells in Pennsylvania. There are going to be 100,000. So this is a work in progress for Shell. They're showing their shareholders how they're ultimately going to develop an entire area underneath Tioga County. It's partially done here. Now I'm going to show you a different kind of visual. One where you're going to be able to visualize how this has already happened in its complete form. So we're going to go from Pennsylvania to Texas. And we're going to look underneath the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. So this is a Google uh, whatever it is, image from space that Google made of the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. You can see the runways, you can see the uh, parking lots and terminals. Uh, with one click, I'm going to transform that Google Earth image of the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport into the Chesapeake uh, Gas Company image of the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. So there it is. So Chesapeake arranged to lease the entire property of the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport from its owner, 
the cities of Dallas, Fort Worth, entered into a lease, allowed the company to go in and develop as best they could all the gas they could possibly get from underneath the Dallas Fort Worth Airport. And this image puts together everything I've told you so far, I hope. Every red dot in this image is a pad location. So there were 53 pads developed on the Dallas Fort Worth Airport property. Every red line that you're looking at here is a lateral from one of the vertical wells coming down from one of those pads. So you can see there are literally 100 or so laterals. And this is what I call spatially intense development. If you have the right, the legal right, and you have the capital, you want to get all the gas you can out of your warehouse. In this case, the warehouse was the entire property underneath the Dallas Fort Worth Airport. Put as many pads as you can, drill as many wells as you have the capital to drill and the geology demands, run the laterals out as far as you like to to optimize the performance of each well. And in this case, you've gotten about as much gas as you possibly can out of that property. So you have to map this image back to where you live, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Arkansas, wherever you live. This is the objective. What I'm pointing to here, uh, and you're seeing on the PowerPoint, is the objective of modern shale gas development. It doesn't work well economically unless it's spatially intense. It involves, repeating myself here, clustered pads. You can see a cluster of pads here, 53 of them on one property, and multi-wells from each pad. And remember, each one of those wells is much larger, consuming more or less 100 times more frac fluid and producing more or less 100 times as much waste as conventional gas wells. I'm going to ask you to use your imagination again one more time and map forward in time to a different place. So I'm going to ask you to take that image that you now have of what happened under the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport and take it to your vicinity, to your neighborhood. So every company that wants to develop has to declare uh, to the relevant regulatory agency, state of Pennsylvania, state of Texas, whatever, an area under which they want to develop the gas. So that's called a spacing unit or a developmental unit, and it's typically something like a rectangle, not a perfect rectangle all the time. But this image shows two maps uh, of proposed spacing units, rectangular areas that one operator wanted to put in New York State. And you'll notice that the, in both cases, these rectangles are oriented north, northwest, south, southeast. And in each case, there was going to be a pad more or less in the center of this rectangle. And from that pad, there would be, in this case, 10 wells. And so that shows, again, that there are going to be multiple wells from each pad. And it shows how the geology and the leasing arrangements allow the company to optimize the direction in which they're drilling the laterals and to optimize the spacing of the pads. So now let's map forward in time, go to a place, for example, in upstate New York. Uh, again, a Google Earth image uh, of an area. Uh, the scale is in the lower left. This is a two mile scale. And so now let's imagine what would be like in upstate New York if what happened under the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, which is industry ideal, were to happen. So every one of those yellow rectangles would be a spacing unit or a development unit. Every one of those red blocks would be a pad location. And from each pad, there would be multiple wells drilled in this area of the country, north, northwest, south, southeast. In other areas of the country, the directions would be different. So this one image captures the future, but it also involves the past. It's, it involves the history of the evolution of shale gas development to its current optimal. Um, cluster the pads with spacing that's ideal for the geology. Multiple wells, capture as much gas under each spacing unit as you can. Um, to prove to you that this is in fact happening today, uh, this is a map of Tioga County, Pennsylvania. I'll blow it up. And what you can see is, in this case, the holdings of one company, Shell. Uh, each one of these rectangular-like areas is a spacing unit. And a dot in each one of those units is a proposed pad location. And this is spatially intensive development of one operator, one of many operators in Tioga County, Pennsylvania. So this is how it happens. And it's important that you understand how it happens because it means that 
the potential for leaks of solids, liquids, and gases is much more heightened by shale gas development than by traditional or conventional development. Because of the spatial intensity, there are going to be pads as many places as the operators can put them, and from each pad there are going to be much more high volume wells, multiple wells, and so the possibility of bad things happening is enhanced. So that's all underground. I began by showing you some of the pictures of what's happening above ground, but there are a couple of things I haven't shown you. Um, flaring. In this image you'll see what appears to be a fire in the air. That's a flare stack. So they're burning off methane. It's product. They can't get it to market for various reasons. There might not be a pipeline in place. They might not have a high capacity separator in place yet to separate the gas from the flowback fluid. And so in the meantime, they're burning off product. That flare burns for a few weeks, night and day, 24 seven. So it involves light pollution because you'll notice there are some families living right behind that flare. They can't turn off the lights. That's very, very bright at night. Noise pollution. That flare is operating at over 100 dB 24-7 for a few weeks. Uh, some people are concerned about the trade-off between natural gas development and coal development because during coal sometimes we remove mountaintops. The next point I want to make is that don't think that just because you live in an area where there are mountains and valleys and steep slopes that those won't be developed. So here's a series of images that shows how in some cases they remove mountaintops to put a pad in a waste lagoon for shale gas development. This is an image that shows how they sometimes have to move a lot of earth to literally create a pad on the side of a mountain. And this image shows how they sometimes have to remove the side of a mountain in order to have space for a pad. So it doesn't matter whether we're in Plano, Texas or in upstate New York or in West Virginia, if there's gas, they will move mountains or create mountains to get to it. Some closer images um, of processing plants. Again, these are effectively refineries that separate the various products that come up from a natural gas well. It's not just natural gas. Uh, propane, butane, ethane, even oil uh, can be produced from shale. And so these are processing plants that uh, emit the usual things that emit, get emitted from refineries. Compressor stations um, typically run 10,000 horsepower diesel pumps 24-7, 365 for years. So again, the potential for noise pollution um, and emission of VOCs is there. So I talk about this whole process in terms of myths. And one of the myths is that uh, by using this modern technology, spatially intense development, clustered pads, multi-wells, that this reduces surface impact. Well, if you don't have any impact right now, it's kind of hard to get less than none. And there are places in the U.S. and around the world where there is no shale gas development, so I can hardly see logically how doing it reduces surface impact. On the other hand, uh, it doesn't, because I just showed you images of what's happening on a single pad basis, a single compressor station basis, a single processor station, a single effluent pond, but I also proved to you that this is going to be done in a spatially intense development. They're going to be contiguous versions of each of these surface infrastructure elements. So the truth is that this technology, multi-well pads, cluster drilling, facilitates and prolongs what's obviously intense industrialization and it leaves a larger, longer-term footprint. So what? As health professionals, you want to know the answer to so what? What are the potential health impacts? I've listed some of them here. Long-term noise, dust, and light pollution for reasons that you've now seen through the images. Um, Noxus. We're burning a lot of diesel to run all the equipment to build the pads, drill the wells, frack the wells, run the compressor stations, uh, run the processing units. Those are known to be sources of noxious emissions. Because this is spatially intense and because there's very high volumes of everything, solid, liquid, and gas, the probabilities of being spills go up and the probabilities of larger spills go up. 
And there will be, and there are, venting and accidental emissions of produced gases. All right, so there you got it. Drilling 101, fracking 101, uh, infrastructure 101. How do you get gas out of a shale formation? Now you're experts. You're going to show it on your exam. Next thing I want to talk about are two specific pathways uh, for potential impact on human health. One is local, having to do with private water wells, and the other is basically global, affecting the entire earth. So I'll spend the rest of my lecture talking about these two potential pathways. First is what we call fluid migration from faulty wells. No gas well that's drilled is going to be guaranteed to be perfectly leak-proof for its lifetime. And we're talking about a lifetime of many, many years, perhaps scores of years, certainly decades. So we have to ask first, why do wells leak? And when they leak, what happens? Where does the leaking stuff go? So we'll talk about that for the next few minutes. First, I want to show you a video of what I mean by a leaking well. So in this video, you see a gray blob in the middle of the video. That's the casing. That's the production casing, the thing that went down vertically and then went laterally. So it's only order of three miles long from the surface all the way out to the end of the well. And the purpose of that casing is to transport to the surface whatever you're trying to get out of the shale, natural gas. And theoretically, if this well is drilled perfectly, cemented perfectly, fracked perfectly, and remains perfect throughout its lifetime through maintenance and inspection, the only place stuff comes out of the ground is up through that pipe. But when a well leaks, you can start the video. When a well leaks, hopefully you can hear that, gases can come up outside the well. So what you're seeing here is a telltale. You're seeing bubbling in water. So why is there water around the wellhead? I'll wait for it to stop. There's water around the wellhead because there's an area excavated around the wellhead called the cellar, C-E-L-L-A-R, and that typically fills with rainwater or snow melt and therefore becomes uh, an unintended telltale. An inspector goes to a wellhead and sees bubbling. That means the well is leaking. The absence of bubbling at a wellhead, unfortunately, doesn't mean the well is not leaking. <laughs> but we'll talk about that if we have time. So I just wanted to show you what it means when a well leaks. That methane and other hydrocarbon gases are coming to the surface. On their way to the surface, it's possible that they will intersect an underground source of drinking water, somebody's private water supply. Even if they don't come in contact, if these gases do not come in contact with somebody's drinking water, they're now getting vented into the atmosphere and their greenhouse gases. And we'll talk about that later in this lecture. So that's an example of a leaking well. Well, how well often do wells leak? Should we, should we be concerned about this? Are we going to see a large percentage or a large number of leaking wells potentially having an impact on drinking water? So I should have said at the beginning of my presentation to you, virtually everything I'm presenting to you in this lecture is derived from industry data, industry reports, industry publications. So every one of my slides has a, an app, uh, a citation of where I got it. So this is data from an industry publication, uh, it's a bar chart that plots the percentage of wells of given ages that are leaking, starting with brand new wells, lower left, all the way up to wells that are well past their maturity, over 30 years old. This data shows that new wells leak at the rate of about 1 in 20. More or less 5% of new wells leak and that the rate at which the wells leak increases with time, which you'd expect because over time, wells degrade. Cement cracks, cement shrinks, steel corrodes, maintenance isn't done according that it should be. Companies sell wells to another company, they sell wells to another company, and you have this progression of absence of maintenance and repair. And so as wells age, the percentage of them that leak goes up. So this is data from about 40,000 offshore oil and gas wells. Next data is from 340,000 onshore oil and gas wells all in Canada. And I'll let you study this in detail. Uh, but again, this is industry data, and it shows that as a result of this survey, somewhere between 4 and 5% of the wells overall were leaking in one way or another. 
But this study went on to look at the differences between old conventional wells and newer, what are called deviated wells. Deviated wells are wells that are not just vertical, i.e. wells that have a lateral, for example. And the data is skewed, as shown in this bar chart. And for wells that are deviated, the percentage of wells that are leaking is much higher. So unfortunately, we have an indication here that the kind of technology that's used for shale gas production, deviated wells with long laterals, are more prone to leaking than conventional wells. And finally, we can go fast forward to today and ask what's the best that the industry is doing in the most current large development of shale gas, which is in Pennsylvania. And so Renee Santoro and I went into the database from the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection and asked the question, how many wells are leaking? And we looked over the last three years and we determined from Pennsylvania's database that in 2010, 6.2% of the wells drilled that year were leaking. In 2011, that rate was again 6.2%. And uh, up until August, I've updated this data and I'll send you the, if necessary, the revised data. Up until August of this year, uh, again, about 7.2% of the wells were leaking. Again, so what? That sounds like a good grade. If only six or seven percent of the wells are leaking, that wouldn't be so bad, except that uh, we're expecting Pennsylvania to see 100,000 wells, New York to see 50,000 wells, Ohio to see 50,000 wells. So when you take a relatively small percentage of a big number, you can still get a big number. So we can see 10,000 or more wells leaking initially in the Marcella Shale Formation play. I mentioned that uh, the absence of leaking at the surface of a well, near the well head, is not proof that the well isn't leaking. So I'm going to show you another video, in this case, uh, of a stream uh, in northern Pennsylvania, uh, where evidence of bubbling of hydrocarbon gases was observed. And in this case, the well was 2,200 feet away from where these leaks were observed nearly a half a mile, that well was not observed to be leaking at the surface, at the wellhead. But it was obviously leaking below ground, and the hydrocarbon gases were finding their way through various under, under, underground mechanisms to the shale formation itself, and the layers of rock above the shale formation, and the gas was finding its way laterally away from the well, but daylighting in a stream. So the data I showed you that says something on the order of 5, 6, 7 percent of the wells leak initially is, is lower bound data. We know that more than that leak because you can't know how many are leaking unless you went out and surveyed an entire area. Look at all the streams for bubbling and look for bubbling in the woods. So again, there's a myth that fluid migration from faulty wells is rare. We shouldn't concern ourselves about it with the potential for human health impacts by despoiling of people's underground sources of drinking water or putting VOCs into the air uh, in a gas field. But the truth is that fluid migration from faulty wells is a well-known problem. It's a chronic problem. It's been around for a long time. And it's always going to be around because the companies don't want it to happen. And despite their best efforts, as in Pennsylvania, where we have, quote, the world's toughest regulations, we have the most modern technology, the most modern cements, the failures are still occurring at their, at their traditional rates. It's just really difficult to do this. So, so what? From the human health impact, we have the potential for contamination of underground sources of drinking water with whatever was down there that is now having a pathway through a leaking well. It could be gases, it could be liquids. It could be hydrocarbon gases, it could be drilling fluids, it could be frac fluid. Uh, every time we punch a hole a mile down and we're punching a lot of holes, we have to gasket those holes so they don't leak. And I just showed you that the gaskets are far from foolproof. I promised I'd do two vectors for potential harm to human health. This is the last one. And I told you the previous one was local. What might happen to an individual water well? Uh, if it was contaminated by a leaking well. Now we're going to look at the global issue of is natural gas a clean fossil fuel? And I think you all know when we use the word clean and when the industry uses the word clean, we mean impact on climate change. So the question has two parts. 
what greenhouse gases, and I emphasize gases, plural, what greenhouse gases find their way into the atmosphere as a result of the production and use of natural gas? That's the first part. That's a technical question. We should be able to measure how much gets into the atmosphere and answer that, although those measurements have not been done. The second part is, a so what? So if greenhouse gases get into the atmosphere as a result of shale gas production and end use, how do they affect climate change? I think you'll agree with me that perhaps the largest potential impact on human health that we've ever invented is human impact on climate change. So what are the gases that are produced when you drill for and get shale gas out of the ground and you do all the things that the infrastructure does to it, cleans it, compresses it, stores it, transports it, and then you burn it for electricity, home heating, cooking, industrial uses. Well, it's a fossil fuel, like coal and oil. You burn it, you get carbon dioxide. We know that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere is rising. And there's overwhelming evidence from climate science that that rise in carbon dioxide is increasing average Earth temperature. We know that that rise is roughly two parts per million per year. And we know that we can't get that rise get to about 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere or some really bad feedbacks are going to happen, some of which we're beginning to see in the form of more intense, more frequent storms, droughts. We're already at 395 parts per million. We don't want to get to 450, that we got about 60 parts to go, which means we have about 30 years to do something about this problem. And the problem is fossil fuels, their use. They all produce carbon dioxide when they're burned. Much less carbon dioxide by burning natural gas than coal or oil. That's incontrovertible. That's proven science. But I emphasize gases, and carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas that we get from the production and use of natural gas. We also get methane, which is natural gas, CH4. Turns out, unfortunately, that the concentration of methane in the Earth's atmosphere is also rising, as shown in this chart. Why? And what are the impacts? Well, it's important to note that even though the concentration in Earth's atmosphere today of carbon dioxide is about 395 parts per million, the concentration of methane is only about two parts per million. So one might think, for example, well, then it's irrelevant. Only two parts per million methane, 395 parts per million carbon dioxide. We should only worry about carbon dioxide because there's very little of this. But then you'd be neglecting the science. And the science is, as shown in this slide, that Methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. You can't equate them. They're not equatable. One molecule of methane does a lot more heat trapping in the Earth's atmosphere than one molecule of carbon dioxide. So now the next science question is by how much? And the answer is, well, it depends upon how long you're willing to wait. If you want to wait 100 years and say, well, what was the effect of this molecule of methane as opposed to this molecule of carbon dioxide, well, over 100 years, that methane a molecule, mo molecule of methane was 33 times more potent than that molecule of carbon dioxide. But I just got through telling you we don't have 100 years to wait. Um, if we look over 20 years, then that molecule of methane is 105 times more potent than a molecule of carbon dioxide, which means that a very small amount of methane has the effect of a very large amount of carbon dioxide which means we have to be extremely sensitive to small leaks, whether those leaks are accidental or purposeful. Where does methane leak? Uh, during the initial frac fluid flowback period, I'll show you a video of that, routinely and continuously during the drilling uh, and fracking, during liquid unloading, during gas processing, and certainly during transmission, storage, and distribution. So methane does leak. The question we don't know the answer to right now, and it's a technical question, is how much leaking is occurring. Um, let me show you where a lot of this leaking occurs. This would be a picture of a frack job in operation. So we're at a pad, a multi-well pad in Pennsylvania. That's all the 10,000 horsepower frack pumps that are pumping fracking fluid down those wells. When the fluid comes back up, it comes, up, it comes back up with methane, and it's either vented or it's flared. I showed you a picture of a flare some time back. I'm now going to show you a video of what it looks like when it's vented. So if we were standing next to a pad while there's flowback occurring, 
and that flow back contains a lot of methane, and that methane is not being captured, it's not going into a pipeline, it's not being flared, burned off, it's vented. And in many cases it is, it just goes into the atmosphere. So this would be a, 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 a human visible picture of a pad during flowback. And in the middle you can see what appears to be water vapor, and it is uh, being emitted from the flowback uh, fluid. But I'm not going to show you a video of what happens when you use not a standard camera on your iPhone, but you use a FLIR camera, forward-looking infrared radar, which has been tuned to detect the temperature differences associated with the emission of methane and other hydrocarbon gases. So in the next video, which is in false color, anything that you see in yellow is a hydrocarbon gas. So we'll start the video. And it's hard to judge scale here, but if you let the video run, it'll go back to the same image I showed you at the beginning, which shows the piece of heavy equipment on the pad. And you'll see that what you've been looking at here are billowing clouds. Those are trees in the foreground. These are billowing clouds of mostly methane being emitted into the atmosphere during the flowback process, which can last for a week or, so, or, or more. And that's a hell of a lot of methane getting into the atmosphere. So it's a primary source um, of methane emissions that are controllable. We don't have to do it this way, uh, but there are no regulations in place yet and certainly won't be enforceable until 2015 by the EPA to prohibit this sort of venting. There's also leakage downstream. So I'm going to take you from one end of the spectrum. We're fracking, we're flowing back, we're emitting methane. Now we're going to the other end, what the industry calls the downstream end. The methane has been compressed, processed, stored, goes into a transmission pipeline, gets into the city of Boston through the distribution network. And this is a set of images taken by Nathan Phillips, a professor at Boston University. And these yellow lines are concentrations of methane that he's actually measured by driving up and down the streets of Boston. And so it shows that there is a significant amount of methane leaking from a very old pipeline distribution system. So across the whole spectrum, from drilling all the way down to end use, there's leakage. What we don't know is how much. Okay. We began to investigate this question at Cornell about three years ago. So we have an inkling at this point, a pretty good inkling, of how much leaking is occurring, purposeful or accidental. So the last couple slides I'm going to show you highlight what we think is the best science to date on this global human health impact. Are we exacerbating climate change and all of its attendant problems that it's going to create with human health issues by increasing the development of yet another fossil fuel which has a double whammy associated with it? It not only produces carbon dioxide when you burn it, but there's a heck of a lot of methane emitted when you produce it and transport it and store it. And as I pointed out, methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas. So we're, quote, pardon the pun, burning our candle at both ends. So uh, Bob Howarth and Renee Santoro and I published a paper about a year and a half ago that was the first paper to investigate this question. How much leaking is occurring and what is its impact on climate change? And this final bar chart, uh, shows a comparison that we published in the magazine Nature, the journal Nature. It compares the impact on climate change from both greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, for shale gas, conventional gas, coal, and oil. So the higher the bar, the more impact. And what we concluded in our first paper, and there have been about 10 papers since our paper investigating the same question, is that we estimated a lower bound and an upper bound. That's two red lines there. The lower red line is our lower bound estimate. The upper red line is our upper bound estimate of the total impact in terms of carbon dioxide and methane on climate change from unconventional shale gas development compared to conventional gas, coal, and oil. And what we concluded and st still stand by and predict when all the dust is cleared over the next few years and measurements have been made over the entire life cycle from drilling to end use, we're going to find out that shale gas is most likely the dirtiest fossil fuel. Um, so any advantage that we perceive right now of transforming our electrical economy from mostly coal to mostly natural gas gets wiped out. Unless we can find a way to drastically reduce the amount of methane leakage which occurs. 
and that's a subject for an economic discussion that I don't have time to get into. Last slide. I hope you've been paying attention because the exam starts in two minutes. Um, this is an image taken from a, the journal Science, published earlier this year, 2012, and it's your climate future. It's the best attempt by the best climate scientists around the world to predict our climate future based on a combination of actual measurements of the past and computer simulation of the future. And I'm going to use this as my final slide to tie together everything I've said about potential health impact because I still hope you agree that the most serious potential health impact um, from shale gas development is exacerbation of climate change. So the horizontal axis in this graph is year, starting with 1900 and going up to projecting up to the year 2070 within our grandchildren's lifetime, in some cases our children's lifetime. The vertical axis is average earth temperature change relative to a baseline. And the International Pan Panel on Climate Control has declared that the period 1890 to 1910, the average earth temperature during that 20 year period is the baseline, it's zero what we use as zero to mark a differential. So the vertical axis starts at zero and goes up to roughly three degrees centigrade. That's degree centigrade. And now I have to explain to you the various elements of this very important last slide. The squiggly line, the squiggly black line are actual measurements up until the year 2010. And these measurements show that the average earth temperature has been on the rise in the past century. It's currently about eight tenths to nine tenths of a degree warmer than it was 110 years ago. That's the squiggly black line. Those are actual measurements. The two areas of color at the top of the slide, one is yellow, one is orange. The yellow area is what we call the warning zone. It starts at 1.5 degrees warming centigrade, ends at two degrees centigrade. The other zone is the zone we never want to get into. That's two degrees centigrade warming because really bad things will have started to happen by then, as opposed to the sort of kind of bad things that are happening now. All right, so we don't want to get into that yellow zone if we can help it, and we certainly don't want to get into the red zone. And so now the question is, how do you project from the measurements to date, that squiggly black line? How do you project forward? How do we tell our future? What crystal ball do we gaze in? We gaze in the crystal ball of computer simulation. It's the best we can do for forecasting the future. It's the same forecasting technique we use to tell you whether you can safely fly across the Atlantic in a 747. It has its warts. No computer simulation is exact, perfect, and correct. It is what it is, a computer simulation, in this case, very complex ones. But there are four curves here, all done by computer simulation. The uppermost curve, the purple one, is business as usual. We project forward from the scientists projected forward from 2010 and said if we do not in any way substantially decrease the production and use of all fossil fuels, if we just go business as usual, we will arrive in the yellow zone in 2030. And we'll arrive in the red zone in 2045. Computer model could be wrong. The error bars are on the right. The right edge will show you the upper and lower bounds of the currently anticipated possible upper and lower bound error on each of these computer simulations. The next thing I want to show you is the red curve. It's called CO2 measures, and that assumed that in 2010, nearly three years ago, globally we had started to substantially reduce fossil fuel, fossil fuel use, thereby reducing the rate at which we're putting carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. What this shows, the computer simulation shows, is that for all practical purposes, nothing good starts happening until 2040 because there's already a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we've been putting there since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and unfortunately, carbon dioxide resides in the Earth's atmosphere for well over 100 years. So this red line says if we were to have started three years ago to do something, then we would get into the red area um, and we'd stay in the red area uh, up until the year 2070 and beyond. The third curve I want to talk about is the one labeled CH4 plus BC measures. That's methane plus black carbon. Black carbon is soot. What you see coming out of diesel engines that aren't running clearly, cleanly or what you get by burning dung in India. 
If we were to have started three years ago drastically decreasing the amount of methane and black carbon we're emitting, then the computer models say that we would have a pretty quick effect. We would delay getting into the yellow by about 15 years. We wouldn't get into the yellow zone until 2040, but then we quickly recover onto the slope of the carbon dioxide or the business as usual measure and we get back into the red, but we don't get into the red until about 2060. So we delay, but we do not solve the problem. We delay, but do not solve the problem. The last computer model says what, happened, what would happen in the future if in 2010, three years ago, we had started drastically decreasing carbon dioxide, methane, and black carbon by reducing the use of fossil fuels, cleaning up our emissions from diesel, uh, stop burning certain biofuels. The computer model says that we get into the yellow zone again about 2040 and we never get into the red zone. So clearly that would have been the right thing to do three years ago. But we didn't start doing it and now three years are going by. So we have three more years of measured data. I don't have it on this chart because it hasn't been published yet, it hadn't been published earlier this year. So we've already delayed not the cure of the problem but we delayed possible delaying the problem by three years. And at this stage, three years is significant. We only have about 30 years to do something about it. So in conclusion, uh, natural gas is a clean fossil fuel if you only consider carbon dioxide, but you gotta consider methane because methane is more potent. So the truth is that over its entire life cycle, unconventional natural gas is likely no cleaner than coal or petroleum. Conventional gas is not much better. They're all fossil fuels, and the use of fossil fuels is bad for climate change. So what's the health impact? Exacerbation of climate change and possible tipping point reached possibly in our lifetimes. I'm speaking to the middle-aged people like me. So I appreciate your attention. Overall, what I tried to show you, briefly summarizing here, is how do they get shale gas out of the ground? What are the local impacts underground? What are the local impacts at the surface? What really does a completely developed shale gas play look like? We don't know yet in the Northeast. You'd have to go to Dallas, Fort Worth to see what a fully developed field. And what are the potential impacts on human health at a local level, for example, from uh, contamination of underground sources of drinking water, created the creation of ozone by all that diesel operating 24 seven in a spatially intense way, and finally, What's the biggest problem we have to worry about here? The biggest problem we have to worry about here is the biggest problem, which is climate change, and this stuff is not good for that. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you really enjoy taking the quiz, and I hope the rest of this course has been very useful to you as practicing health professionals.